Uh, we are joined this morning by former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. He's now president of the Asia Society Policy Institute. CBC Senior Markets Commentator Mike Santoli is also here. CBC Senior Economics Reporter Steve Leisman is also uh, here. But I'm going to go to you, Prime Minister. You've had a long relationship with China. I want to know what you think the Chinese have been thinking this last week. Not happy thoughts. Mm -hmm. And what are they going to do? The bottom line is uh, things were manageable when we had the trade negotiations break down in early May. I was in Beijing at the time, I was there for a couple of weeks, and look, there was a lot of toing and froing, but if you got below the froth and the ferment, there was still a around just above 50% prospect that we could land this thing. It's a complex mix, as you know, of politics and economics. But the two big factors uh, in the last uh, few, few days, the 10% decision on tariffs by the president, uh, plus uh, his statement about currency manipulation, which is just, frankly, empirically wrong and, in a tactical negotiating sense, dumb, 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 uh, is now just push the politics to an extent in Beijing that it makes the possibility of reaching a trade deal before the end of this year uh, now sub-50, in my view. OK, but what is the <clears throat> chance that President Trump didn't want to make a deal this year? And what is the chance, actually, that the Chinese didn't want to make a deal either? That no, they're playing this election cycle in some way that, we, that hasn't been fundamentally articulated to the public but is behind the scenes. I'll, I'll let your analysis of what goes on in the president's mind to yourself. I'm not sure, but if I see global economic data beginning to head south in a more significant way, you're looking how weak Germany is. Look at what the three central banks have just done. The Australian Central Bank um, took off 25 basis points last, week, uh, last month as on temporary hold now. Frankly, the global economy is starting to look... Uh, in a difficult situation. Why the president, therefore, going into a re-elect next year in 2020 would like to throw fuel onto the fire defies my imagination. Bottom line, in uh, Beijing, I, I, they'd I, like to land it. They'd like to land it. The domestic softening in China, quite apart from what the trade war has done, has been in place for about two years now through a set of, I think, poor but domestic what, But what about the argument that, A, he likes a boogeyman, B, it's a real boogeyman in that he's not getting what he wants, He's asked for it on the agricultural side, that they've broken the deal, that on the IP uh, theft issue and everything else, that there are really uh, no, no restraints around it, and that, that he effectively is using his leverage properly. And by the way, you would make that argument, I imagine, no? Um, yes, I would, I would make that argument, essentially. I would, I, I would add that President Trump needs a strong economy to increase the probability of being elected. And this dragging into next year could be really problematic, in particular if tariffs go from 10 to 25 percent. I think the thing we don't know here, Kevin, and maybe you have a view, is how painful will these tariffs be on the Chinese economy? And will we ever know? Or is that really just what she and his advisors will know? And is it possible he's going to have to pull up on the stick because the tariffs are too painful and possibly we could get a 2019 resolution? We're crossing a pain threshold now in, in China in the real economy. If you, looked, if you speak to people in Beijing about what's happening in terms of real activity, it's getting softer and softer. Add the, the, the fuel from the trade war and it's getting more and more difficult. Xi Jinping's bottom line is he wants to see this trade war end. Um, he can play the politics of the American boogeyman as well as anybody else. And they're doing that through the propaganda organs of the central party. The problem is, on the American side, if you want to create the boogeyman for the 2020 election, be careful what sort of boogeyman you create. Because if, uh, if, you, if you head in that direction and it really begins to blow back, not just in the trade war, but in the technology war and in the currency war, which we haven't touched on yet this morning, then frankly, the ability of the Chinese to do damage here is real. If I was the president, and if I was Xi Jinping, I'd be trying to land this thing this year. It's still doable, but the president's just added a whole new degree of political difficulty. At the same time here in the U.S., Mike, the stock market reaction sort of gives the president a little bit of cover. I mean, we've been fairly resilient even in the face of the trade war. And, and yesterday at 9 o'clock when the, the fixing was done in China and it was a little bit weaker than expected, yeah. I thought for sure that... U.S. futures would be down this morning, and here right. we are. And, and granted, they're up only marginally, but still a very yeah. muted. Yeah, it's hard. To, you don't want to extrapolate because we're in a it's very kind of whippy period after a pretty sharp sell-off. Yeah. So you don't know what the what the reflex bounces are all about. Plus, you got three central banks around the world easing overnight after the Chinese uh, fix. So I do think that's a dynamic win. 
the, the pattern has been when we get this escalation of trade aggression and friction, <clears throat> the market adjusts to that as the status quo eventually. It punishes the companies directly in the line, but it doesn't necessarily fall apart entirely. But I do think it requires that it not be escalated further. And it no, doesn't turn the screw on, on the, you, the global economy to a point where that's what we're worrying about. The market only really cares about it in that context. It's not about the substance of an eventual agreement or anything like that. It's just about are you making things worse for the economic outlook globally and for corporate profits or not? in this moment. And I guess that's specifically what we saw in the tech sector when it sold off on the day of the sell-off. Exactly. And then we saw the strong bounce in semis. We saw the strong bounce in Apple. Retailers took it on the chin on Friday on the announcement of those tariffs, and, and they also sort of came back. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, Steve, is the stock market being irrational relative to some of the numbers that you've been talking about? And you, you were in a debate yesterday with a different mm -hmm. Kevin right over here about True, the, the impact <laughs> of, of, of this war. Right. Um, so it's like saying, you know, we had tariffs and yada, 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 everything was fine. What you missed in the yada, yada, yada there is this global, very powerful global downdraft in yields. Put up the 10 year this morning. You're under 170. The boon to every time we talk is at a new record low. I'm sorry, my data only goes back to 1958 on the boon, but a negative 0.59 yield. Mm. Um, another trillion dollars of debt globally has now has a negative interest rate yield uh, just in the past two days. Another trillion. So 15 trillion now. Is now it's 15 something, yeah. right? Good counting there, Melissa. It's, it's, Larry Kudlow says, you can be sure the Chinese are hurting worse than we are. What he doesn't say is how much we are potentially going to be hurting from this. It, 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 it's always struck me as incredibly bizarre that the purpose of the policy is one where they hurt more than we do, but we all hurt, hmm. rather than a policy where everybody does well and benefits, which was much closer to the old regime here. So, um, and, and, and by the way, we weren't getting anywhere with that. When you when you ask the Chinese, hey, will you please Im please improve things? For us and for you, the answer is we'll improve things for us, but not for you. I'm going I'm to let Kevin talk about whether or not the current way we... Well, first of all, there is a complete myth that's been proffered by many people that it hasn't worked for 17 years. That's a lie, okay? Because only 17 years ago, China entered the WTO. Upon entering the WTO, tariffs in China came way down. U.S. companies went in. As I documented yesterday, U.S. companies do $340 billion as of 2016 of business every year over there. It's one of the most profitable businesses they do. You heard, by the way, Iger say overnight that China hasn't messed with what's going on there. And so there's far. a reason for that, because U.S. companies employ millions of Chinese people. So that's a big deal. But let me just throw this to Kevin, because he knows more about it. Kevin, is this a better way to get China to the table than what we did before? And did what we did before totally not work? Look, my bottom line is, <clears throat> and I've said on this program many times, President's pressure on this, even though I hate tariffs, focused China's attention. But the landing point to get a really reasonable deal, including on intellectual property, including on false technology transfer, was with us in May. My deep line, baseline fear is that the politics of this when I look at it from the Beijing angle, is now sliding out of our control. And when politics takes on politics, then I begin to fear that economic rationality goes out the door. Um, so... And you think that's where we are. When Goldman Sachs says that no deal can happen until 2020, if not beyond, does that now seem more realistic to you than... It's... Uh, I'm still in the camp just that sense will prevail to land something before the end of this year. But I'm only there just. We're now at a kind of a, a level of nine of political difficulty on the Richter scale. Chinese leadership in August all go to the beach. You might think that sounds fun. It's not. It's the beach at Beidouhe, just east of Beijing. It's not the prettiest place to swim. I've been there. But they go there for a month's worth of meetings. And there will be one topic on the agenda this year is what do we do with these guys in Washington? Are they real about landing a deal? Or do we double down on the politics, because that's going to work for us as well, despite a softening economy? We are now in the month of August in the balance 
on the political economy question. They've got ter they have terrible options. At that meeting at the beach, they don't have any good options. They're in more of a pickle than we are here. The only thing they think they've got to play is currency. And uh, we've seen, if you've just... What does, that, what does that mean, though, Kevin? Devalue well, the currency? That's terrible for them. They're trying to move to a consumer-led economy. But they can strengthen the in, currency, in, and then that'll, that'll, that'll hurt their manufacturing base even further. It's when currency policy begins to be dictated by politics rather than the transformation of China into a long-term domestic demand-driven economy where you actually need, uh, frankly, the uh, import sector to be working well. All I'm saying is, and I'm sure it's never happened here in the United States, when politics triumphs economics, you get really crazy decisions. Both sides. Of the we always get crazy decisions because politics always trumps economics.